Maxie, I'm going to have to let you and my mom fight over who decided to try to talk me into going into preaching. So you'll just have to get with her after the sermon this morning and see who wins that battle. I think I know who's going to win that one. A good friend of mine told me when I first moved to Oklahoma, being a native Texan, he said, Tommy, you've messed up. And I said, why is that? And he said, because if you ever go broke in Oklahoma, you'll never have the money to get out. Well, when I got to the gate last night, it was unguarded, so I just slipped through it and came on in. And they did let me back into Texas, at least for today. And I'm glad to be here. As I look around and as I came into the building this morning, there's so many people here that are so important to me. While I was in school here, uh, people like the Hamiltons and the Powells and the Barnums were sort of surrogate parents for me while I was here and uh, took care of me if I was running a little short of money and didn't have any food. They seemed to know that. I didn't have to ask. They just invited me over and I got a good meal. And a lot of preacher students have enjoyed that same kind of fellowship and that kind of hospitality from this tremendous congregation. <clears throat> and I know that we've all been blessed by having been associated with it. And if you didn't attend school here, simply attending these lectures for the last 16 years has been such a blessing to our brotherhood. And uh, we hope and pray that this uh, lectureship will be able to continue on and will continue to bless our lives as, uh, as it has for all of these years. And uh, again, there are so many that are here that are important to me. Brother Jim Hall, who also had a lot to do with not only talking me into preaching, but gave me lots of opportunities to do that at Valley Mills as he would step out of the pulpit and, and pull me into it and uh, get me to preaching when I was a teenager. And uh, he influenced a lot of young men in that direction. When we begin to consider how to live the Christian life, it's simply natural to look around and to find those who exemplify those attitudes that we want to develop the best. Yesterday, as I was watching my cowboys, they interviewed Mike Ditka at halftime, and they were talking to him about his attitude about coaching, and he said, well, I wouldn't move anywhere where I couldn't do it my way. And they mentioned the two men that had, had helped him learn how to coach. And he said, well, maybe I do some things their way, but I'm not conscious of it. Well, I think in Christianity that we are very conscious of those who are our, our examples. And we look for those that, that exemplify the attitude of service that this morning we're here to discuss and to learn as much about as we possibly can. And no greater group of men exists than the prophets that show us the attitude of the servant outside of our Lord Jesus Christ. These men exhibited the attitudes and the acceptance of what God wanted them to do and the activities that exemplify service better than anyone else that we could find within the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 6, as Isaiah realizes through the vision of God sitting on His throne above the temple, that he is not what he should be. He says, I am undone, and I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for I have seen the king. And God sends the seraphim down to cleanse his lips, and immediately when that happens, and he hears the discussion of who shall go for us, and who shall we send, Isaiah is so willing that he says, Here am I, send me. What an attitude of service. The man was ready to serve. Four times in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, God refers to his prophets as my servants, the prophets. God pays to them the highest possible compliment. These men are my servants. And so today I believe if we will just take a brief look at what these men did, the way they responded and reacted, that we'll come to understand the spirit of service better than we ever have before. And hopefully this will inspire us. I know as a gospel preacher, I often need greater motivation. I need encouragement. I need strength. Those blue days that were discussed a little while ago come so readily. And we need that building up and that encouragement. And when you turn to the pages of the prophets, and you understand what these men did and the circumstances in which they were done, it does encourage us to greater service and to be a servant of the Lord. The first thing that is impressive as we see with Isaiah 
is that these men were willing to accept the assignment of God. Isaiah knew the difficulty that, were, that were, would lay before him. The difficulty of speaking to a people who did not want to hear and did not want to obey God's will. And so he knew this was not going to be an easy ministry, most difficult. But he accepted the assignment which God gave. Jeremiah struggled with his assignment. In Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, he said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak in his name anymore. And his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Jeremiah struggled, as many of us do, as gospel preachers, as members of the Lord's body, against a day and time in which the world many times does not want to hear the gospel, and even the people that we work with. And that we stand side by side with in the body of Christ. Many are willing to sell out and compromise. And yet, like Jeremiah, hopefully as we struggle, we'll struggle through that. And as the Word of God has grown within our hearts, it will be a burning fire that must burn its way out. We must serve the Lord. We must preach His Word. We must be faithful to that which we have been given. Before a deadly mob, a little while later, Jeremiah will say, The Lord has sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city with all the words that you have heard. But know for certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves, on this city, and on all of its inhabitants. For truly the Lord has sent me to speak all these words in your hearing. Jeremiah 26, 12 through 15. Jeremiah knew who sent him, who gave him the assignment. And he had accepted that assignment, though through a struggle, and now would preach even to those who were seeking his own life. What great strength we see in the prophet Jeremiah. Isaiah was so overjoyed when he heard the, the, the possibility of what could be done. Who will go for us? And he readily says, here am I, send me. The Bible does not declare all of the emotions that were going on at that point in time, but there seems to be a great deal of, of willingness. There seems to be an excitement, a joy to accept the task which God had given him. Hosea was so willing to accept the assignment that God gave him that when God began to get specific about what would need to take place, in Hosea 1 and verse 2 he says, And you shall take a wife of harlotry, and children of harlotry. Hosea may appear on the surface to be one of the strangest books in all the Bible. But when you delve into it, what Hosea learned as a result of his marriage and his family, Gomer leaving him later, going out into the world, prostituting herself, that this is what was happening with Israel and God. Israel was prostituting itself with the world, with its idolatry that it was following after. No longer serving her husband. No longer serving her master. No longer serving God. And so Hosea learned a valuable lesson. But think of the willingness of that man. Yes, Lord, I'll go for you. Yes, Lord, I'll, I'll preach to these people. Yes, Lord, I'll marry a woman who will be unfaithful to me. And some children who will not be my own, I will raise within my house. What a great attitude. What great acceptance of the will of God. Brethren, it's heartrending when we look around our brotherhood and we hear the things that are coming out of some of our pulpits. Because it's apparent that many of our brethren are not willing to accept the assignment of God to simply preach His Word. The Bible teaches us that we must not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1 and verse 16. And to balance that, not only are we not to be ashamed of that gospel, but we are to love those that we preach to, and we are to preach the truth in love, both for our God and for the people that we are preaching to. And yet it seems that that assignment has fallen on the deaf ears of some as they are beginning to argue against, in fact, the validity of the word and argue against whether or not it has any authority, or whether most of the Bible has any authority, yet perhaps they will accept a few of the things that Jesus may have said directly. It's heartrending, frightening, to think that some would back down and compromise to such a degree. 
We would expect such things from those who are not of the body of Christ. But for those within the body of Christ, it's terrifying to think that this is the prospect of what may happen and is happening around us. A few years ago, as I began to preach in Scurry, Texas, I was having to support myself by going out and doing a little bit of substitute teaching in a town nearby. And I would take my pocket Bible with me and on breaks that we would have during the day, do some of the study that I would do and then study at night. And while I was doing this one day at lunch, there was a lady sitting near me, a fellow teacher, and she began to talk to me and, and she said, what are you studying? And I began to talk to her about what I was studying and she asked me what my religion was and I told her and we began to discuss the Bible to some degree and she told me what denomination she was a part of. And as we began to discuss the differences, she immediately wanted to go into that, and I began to talk to her about the fact, well, we simply go by what the Word of God says. And that seemed strange to her, and she said, well, then what do you do about this and that and the other? And we discussed a specific item of worship. I pointed out what the Bible taught. And she said, well, I see that the Bible says that, but I just can't accept it. We expect that of people of the world or people in erroneous religion. But of our own brethren, we have got to develop a much more willing spirit to accept the assignment of God and to accept the assignment of God as He has given it. And we need to understand the urgency of the acceptance of that work. Moses, as he was about to die, and in that famous song of Moses that we read of, says this concerning the words, Set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law. For it is not a futile thing for you, because it is your life. And by this word you shall prolong your days. Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47. The word is your life, he says. This is how you will prolong. This is how you will continue to be able to live in my presence. It is by the Word of God. We need to accept the assignment of God. And we need to stay faithful to it. There are two things that must be believed if we are going to be able to accept the assignment which God has given us today. First is that the Word is from God. And there's really two sides of that that, that I want us to see. One is that yes, it is the Word that has come from God. We see in for instance, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. It is the Word of God. It is the Word which comes from God. But just as Moses at the burning bush heard God's assignment given to him, he didn't immediately accept it, but then did. God told him that when you go to my people and when you go to Pharaoh, say to them that I am has sent you. We need to understand that not only is the word from God, but that God is the one who is giving us the assignment to go with that word. And that also God is going to back us up when we preach that word. Look at what he did for Moses. And while we you know, today do not expect for staffs to become serpents, we know that our Father is still there. We know that our Father is still right behind us as we preach His Word. That He is with us every step of the way. Jesus in the Great Commission tells His disciples, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus would be right there with them. And so will our Father. And Hebrews 13 and 5 teaches us that neither will I leave you nor forsake you. God will be with us in the proclamation of His Word. Therefore, it should be easier to accept that assignment. But we need to believe that the Word is from God. Secondly, we need to believe the gravity of the task that is before us. I don't really believe that Jonah did. Jonah did not accept the assignment at first. In fact, he ran away. But then when God persuaded him by means of the belly of a fish, he decided that he would go. I don't believe that the spirit of the servant is seen in Jonah. But the gravity of the task is seen because when he gets there to the, the large city of Nineveh teeming with people and he preaches God's Word, the whole city responds. Now, can you imagine going in to do a, a gospel meeting or a campaign in a city in the United States today and the entire city turning out and listening and then responding? 
to the invitation of God? We just can't even imagine that, yet it happened in Nineveh. The gravity of the task is, is that the word that we preach is a word of salvation. It's a word that, when heard and understood and put into the hearts of people, will produce fruit. And it means the difference between heaven and hell for everyone. The gravity of the task is upon us to preach the Word of God. Paul accepted that and says in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. This should be the Spirit that's within us. That I can't do anything but preach the Word of God. We must preach the Word. I think back in my own life to those who did support me and who encouraged me to preach. Brother Maxie and really so many others. Not only that, but then when you look behind that, to the fact that God wants us to preach His Word, God wants us to be faithful to His Word, and God has encouraged us to do that, how could we ever quit? How could we ever stop? So many who love us and say, this is what needs to be done. And God who loves us and says, this must be done. This is my assignment. This is my will. We must accept the assignment of God to preach His Word. And the prophets give us such a beautiful example of the willingness to accept the assignment of God. The second thing that we see among the prophets is that they exhibited before us a great serving attitude. Now an attitude, according to Webster, is this. It's a mental position with regard to a fact or state. So the mental position of the prophets, though the Bible does not tell us everything that they thought, is nonetheless apparent by the attitudes which they exhibited. Their mental position was, this is the fact that God has laid before us. His people are in need. The Word needs to be preached. And I need to do that which God has sent me to do. Their attitude is the attitude of a servant. Virtually none of the prophets uh, were, were in a popular ministry. They had difficult times before them. Shemaiah stands against the decision of Jeroboam to go up and to fight against Israel. And whenever, whenever God talks to him through Shemaiah, he says, God has said, do not go up against your brethren, but let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. 1 Kings 12, 21 through 24. Shemaiah was taking his life in his own hands to speak against Jeroboam, yet he's willing to do so. His mental position was, this has to be done. Regardless of what it does to me, I'm going to do the job that God has sent me to do. There's an unnamed prophet just a little while after this in 1 Kings chapter 13. He comes to Jeroboam as he is leaning against an altar, apparently the altar of an idol. And this unnamed prophet, as he speaks to him, reveals to him that there will be a man, Josiah by name, who will come from the household of David, and he will burn the prophets on this idol and the bones of the prophets of Baal upon this idol. And that the altar will be rent, split, and that the ashes will pour forth. When Jeroboam heard this, this shows you how angry he became because he thrust out his hand and he says, arrest him. And he had difficulty pulling his hand back because it withered immediately. And as a sign that what this unnamed prophet was saying was true, the altar immediately split and the ashes poured forth. Attitude of serving God. I'm going to preach His Word regardless of the cost of myself. Paul teaches us that the attitude of serving God must be ours as well. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. For do I persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be the servant of God. Galatians 1, verses 8 and 10. Paul says our attitude must be, this is God's Word. This is what must be preached. I must not in any way pervert it. I must deliver it as God has delivered it to me, because even if an angel of God were to preach something else, he would be accursed. And if I were to preach it from the motivation of just pleasing men, I should not be the servant of God. Prophets truly lived up to that which Paul says many years later. Some of the compromises that are going on in our brotherhood today concern the fact that many have completely gone away from a thus saith Lord for everything that we must do. They're saying this is really not what is important. 
that we need to simply do what is needed by the world. And the felt need syndrome has really begun to devour many in our brotherhood. The new hermeneutic movement, we are hoping, is very isolated, but it may not be. And those in that movement are saying that only what Jesus has said is important. That if you go from really the book of Acts on to the book of Revelation, that these things are just divine suggestions. You can do them if you want, but they are not authoritative. That only direct commands of Jesus are the authority for our lives. Worked with a young man that we discovered later on had that very attitude. And when pressed concerning what would you say to young people concerning the use of the instrument of music or anything of this nature, he said, well, I would say to them that it is our tradition and that I agree with our tradition. What a poor, poor statement. The Bible has taught us how to worship God. The Bible has given us examples of these things. It is authoritative, both by command and inference and example. And these things must be obeyed because God has authorized them. We must not be weak-kneed when it comes to doctrine. We must not begin to weasel out of what we need to preach and what we need to say because it might be popular with some other people. But rather, we need to just stay with the Word of God and preach it as it is, not perverting it in any way. I read an article wherein a man says that if we preach faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, that we are preaching line item salvation. And that what these men are saying is that we would like to have line item veto. We'd like to be able to say, well, if a man uh, really didn't repent of his sins, but he believes that Jesus is the Son of God, okay, he's okay. Or if he confessed, but he was not baptized, he's still okay. But the Bible teaches us that all of these must be adhered to if one is to become part of the kingdom of God. We must not pervert the truth, but we must truly exhibit the same attitude as the prophets, and that is what God has delivered to us, this we will deliver to those who are within our hearing. We will stay with the truth. On the balance of this, though, brethren, we must not just be in the business of preaching against things either. We must not just be in the business of being negative and of saying, uh, this is what God doesn't want us to do. We also need to know what we must do. We need to do, know what's on the positive side of this docket as well. Church is, is struggling for its identity for some reason. And we need to help the church understand that we are here to serve the Lord. We are the body of Christ. We are here to instruct people along the lines of how to obey God, how to work and worship within His kingdom and how to go to heaven when this life is over. Let's point out the positive side of what God has called us to do and not just the negatives concerning what God has told us that we ought not to do. Jesus said, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Revelation 3. Verse 18, Jesus wants us to come to Him for the purity that we need in our lives, for the value that we have within our lives, for the ability to see the fields that are wanted to harvest, and to see what the will for our lives is. We need to turn to Christ. And brethren, we need to develop a much better attitude of service within the body of Christ. And it starts with us. If a preacher is not willing to serve, if people are coming to him and saying, this, this family needs help, I, we would like for you to go make this visit, or to do this or that, or go to this hospital or this nursing home. And we're saying, well, I'm awfully busy. I'm, I'm writing this, or I'm doing that, or I've got to meet with someone else. And they see us constantly backing down and constantly saying no and turning down these opportunities. How will we ever set an example of service before those that we are around all the time, the congregations wherein we preach? Preachers of the Lord's church are going to have to show the attitude of the servant. And if the attitude of service is in the pulpit, it will begin to be greater in the pew. And people will begin to serve the Lord in a greater way than they ever have before. In Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 and following we see that we are to have this mind in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
And Jesus was that one who emptied Himself and came in the form of a servant. Just an ordinary man. He came in that form that He might be able to serve us. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve. We can do, do no better than to follow His example and to follow in His footsteps today. Finally this morning, as we look to the prophets and as we see the way that they lived their lives and what they did with God's Word, as they accepted the assignment which God gave to them, developed great attitudes of service toward Him, it didn't stop there. But now they committed great action on behalf of God. One of, the, one of the odd oddities of our day and time are the, the people that are constantly students but never use what they learn. I've got friends that are 50 years old and they're going back for their third degree. And they've never really used any of them. They're not using it in their business. They're not using it in their personal life. They're not using it in their Christianity. They're professional students is what they are. Oh, they may have uh, accepted the assignment given to them by a teacher. And they may have developed some great attitudes toward going to school. But it's never done them any good because they've never used it with their hands. They've never got about the business of doing God's will. Jeremiah's struggle is very much like ours. After he returned to his work, he took God's word to old Pasher. That priest who had, if you read about Pasher, he had become involved in politics as well as religion. That may have been his undoing. And Pasher was the one who had, who had put him in those stocks. He'd cast him down. But he goes right back to Pasher, and he delivers the Word of God to him. Jeremiah's action was the action of a man who was serving God. Prophets didn't serve in popular times. When the Bible teaches us to preach the Word in season and out of season, it was definitely out of season with most of the prophets. Elijah and Micaiah were bitterly hated by Ahab. When Jehoshaphat and Ahab had decided to join together to go up and fight in a battle, Jehoshaphat, apparently slightly more spiritual than Ahab, said, Is there not a prophet here that we can call that we might understand what the will of the Lord is? And Ahab reluctantly said, Yes, there is my Kai, but I do not like him because he is a man who prophesies evil against me and not good. Bitterly hated because he preached the truth. Elijah was also hated by Ahab's wife, Jezebel. And after that great victory on Mount Carmel, wherein 400 of the prophets of Baal were slain as a result of the truth of God's Word, that God is true and that, and that uh, Baal was just an idol, a, a dead, breathless idol. He comes down from that mountain and receives the word immediately that Jezebel seeks his life and that tomorrow her plans were to make him as one of those prophets of Baal. Take his life from him. Elijah was bitterly hated, and yet he preached the word of God. Jeremiah was hated by old Pasher in Jeremiah 37. The Bible teaches us that the king took the word of God, the scroll, cut it up, and threw it in the fire. Can you imagine serving a day and time like that? And yet maybe we are. When statements are being made by our government officials, that we will not enforce this and we will not enforce that because this is just what religion wants. And truly we're living in a time that's very similar to that of Jeremiah. We're going to have to be those who are committing greater action than we are. We are going to have to have the action of the servant. God has called us to be a people of action. Titus 2 and verse 14 tells us that our Lord died, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. The word zealous means enthusiastic, excited, overjoyed. And yet, what is our facial reaction when someone comes and says, Brother, I'd like for you to go and, and do this job, and maybe it's not really what we like to do the most. Oh, we get a frown on our face. Well, I guess I'll go do it ought to let joy of being able to serve God come through, not only in our hearts, but on our faces. And let people know by the way we live, by the actions we do, that I am glad to be a servant of God, glad to do what He wants me to do. What else are we here for? Ephesians 2 and verses 8 through 10, and talking about how we were saved, says that for, by grace you were saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, 
Not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. This is our purpose. This is why we're here. But today we see the overbalance of that in that some are saying, grace only. You've got to read the rest of the passage. Yes, it is the grace of God that does cleanse us from our sins, but we have to be in a position to receive that grace. Someone came to my door and knocked on my door and said, Tommy, where's my birthday present? And I looked and I didn't know the person. I'd say, well, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was your birthday and I don't know who you are. I wouldn't owe him a birthday present because of the fact that we have no relationship. There's been no position of reception of gifts between us. We must be in the position to receive the grace of God by means of relationship. That's where faith comes in. For by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. But what does God say is going to be able to keep this relationship going so that we are able to serve God in the way that we should? He points out that we are to become His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Work salvation? No, sir. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about works of faith. We're talking about works because I have been saved. Not works in order to save me. God has done that. God accomplished that through Jesus when He went to the cross. But I work and labor with my hands, and you do too, because we love the King, because we love what He did for us, because we love the fact that He has opened for us a door of opportunity to escape sin and to live in His household. The prophets were those who realized that. Just as Isaiah had his lips cleansed, he recognized, I have escaped sin in my life. Now I need to go on behalf of God and make known to people how they also can escape the uncleanness of their lives. James teaches us to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. And the way that we are to do that is by means of the mirror. Because we are not to be like those who go and behold their natural face in the glass and then go away quickly and forget what manner of man they were, but we are to look into the perfect law of liberty. It's the law of Christ. The law which Christ has delivered to us, which liberates us from our sins and causes us to be able to live for Him. So let's look into the mirror of God. And let's see who's looking back at us. And let's determine... This one is going to be a doer and not just a hearer only. We must make sure today that we are looking in that right mirror, that we are looking into the perfect law of liberty, not some watered-down version of what God has sent, not something that has been weakened because we feel so strongly that we've got to fulfill all of the needs of everyone around us, but rather that perfect law which was delivered to us by Christ. 2 Timothy 13 and verse 5 says, Let us examine ourselves to be sure whether or not we are in the faith Let's examine and make sure that the faith is really what we are standing in. We find in Jude verse 21 that the Bible teaches us that we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. Jesus says in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Pretty simple formula. Keep the commandments of God. That means that you've accepted the faith. You've received the faith, which is from God. And then we will be able to keep ourselves in the love of God. Keep ourselves in that relationship which He has delivered to us. Not only must we make sure we're looking in the right mirror, but we need to make sure that we continue to look in the right mirror, that perfect law of liberty, by keeping ourselves in the love of God. And then thirdly, we need to recognize that there is benefit in always examining and then doing what God has sent us to do. We're going to receive benefit from this. We often think that, you know, I'm the one giving everything to God. I'm having to serve Him so much. I'm wearing myself out in His service. But what have we received back? Much more than we've given out. That's for sure. We cannot outgive God. Malachi 3 gives us such a great illustration of that. When God challenged them, bring your tithes into the storehouse and see if I will not fill it up to the overflowing. You can't outgive God. So let's serve Him out of a great spirit of love, of appreciation of all for what He has done on our behalf. In John 13, Jesus comes into the upper room. His disciples haven't washed each other's feet. There's been no servant hired to do that, which was the common custom of the day. These men had still not learned what they needed to learn. 
go following Jesus for three years. Jesus removes His outer garments and begins to wash their feet. These men learned on that occasion the great lesson of becoming a servant of the Lord. And when we look back over the prophets, some of which we have already begun to study in this great lectureship this week, we see the summation of some of their life in Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of fame of faith. The Bible simply states this, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quitched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to, fly, to, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better re resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and of imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Could God say that of you and me? Could God say today, the world is not worthy of those brethren because they're serving me in such a beautiful way. Because they have accepted my will, the assignment which I've given them to do to preach my word. Because they have developed an attitude of service. They're going to serve me regardless of the cost, regardless of how unpopular it might be. And also that they have committed great action on my behalf. Preaching the word of God throughout the world. Reaching souls, loving people, and standing against the error that be. Will God say that of us? We should hope that He would. We can determine that in our lives today by being willing to develop within our own lives the spirit of the servant. God bless you.